We'll call this meeting to order. And uh, first we'll have the uh, pledge by uh, uh, our uh, good uh, member, uh, Representative King. Thank you, sir. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we will have uh, the prayer led by the uh, co-chairman, uh, Representative Dawson. Heavenly Father, we take this opportunity to offer our thanks to you for the blessings and the gifts that you have bestowed upon us. We ask you to guide us through each day, and in particular in this meeting, give us the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to do the things that are best in your eyes. Father, we also ask that you watch over my good friend and our co-chairman, Emery, as he goes through his uh therapy that he's working through right now and once again we say thank you and ask for your guidance as we move through the day in jesus name we pray amen amen okay we're ready for a roll call senator rocky adams senator hornback senator parrott senator webb Here. senator westerfield here from Crofton. Thank you, Senator. Representative Brown? Uh, on his way up the stairs from, <laughs> from his office. Okay, thank you. Representative King? Yes, in the room. Representative Pratt? Here. Representative Reed? Here in the room. Representative Roberts? Present remotely. Thank you, Representative. And Chair Embry? Here in the room. And Chair Dawson? Present in the room. Okay, uh, do I hear a motion that we approve the minutes? Motion. Motion made second. or second. Okay, motion made and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, the motion aye. passes. Okay, we will start with our uh, uh, usual uh, reports from our executive director and deputy executive director of the uh, Agriculture Development Board. Everybody knows who you are, but uh, for the uh, record, ident identify yourself. Good morning, Chairman, Committee. Brian Lacefield, Executive Director for the uh, Kentucky Office of Ag Policy. It's a pleasure to be with you again. I can get to where I'm in the cycle now and know how, how things go. Seems like we just uh, just were here visiting with you, but as I was looking over my calendar to see what happened since was here, uh, it's actually uh, quite a bit. I uh, know we got several uh, items on the agenda, so I'll, I'll move quickly and then uh, let uh, my deputy director go through some of the projects that we funded this time. But uh, since last time I was visiting with you, we have uh, have continued to balance my time uh, traveling the state, uh, engaging with our, our projects, our stakeholders, and, uh, and, uh, and visiting projects and speaking engagements, and then also time in the office trying to, to run, the, uh, run the office. Uh, some highlights since last time we were here, uh, Senator Webb, we had our uh, Farm to Table event in Greenup County that, uh, that we set a, a record there that I've, I've yet to hear broken in the state. We had over over 600 pre-sold tickets for that event, and I think, Senator, almost everybody was there that uh, that day. That that was a fantastic event, and this is only their second year doing, and uh, and all the proceeds uh, for that were going to benefit the, the youth agriculture programs in the uh, community. I then uh, uh, was up to the other side of the state and was down in Hopkinsville to uh, to moderate a panel for the Kentucky Corn Growers Core Group and uh, and Chairman Dawson there we had uh, uh, our friend uh, Wayne Hunt, uh, Jimmy Tosh, and uh, and Willis Jepson that were uh, were speaking to a group of future agriculture leaders on the importance of leadership in their their industry. Then I uh, had the chance to go uh, the two days later over to Meade County, what uh, what is the largest county fair in the state that I'm, I've yet to find.
find a statistic to beat that. And I was the keynote speaker for their fair breakfast. And I thought that was a pretty good uh, prelude to our state fair that will be beginning uh, tomorrow. So I think a lot of, lot of energy and excitement about that. Also, the KDA is having a uh, series of meetings across the state, uh, our land meetings, which is linking agriculture and manufacturing. These are, uh, uh, Tim um, Hughes is running this for the uh, the commissioner, and these are fantastic. It's a different agenda in each community. We're bringing in uh, local folks from both agriculture and manufacturing sectors to uh, to talk about opportunities in, uh, in their industries. Uh, we've had three to date. I think we'd already had the Bowling Green one when I was here last time, but we had uh, the Henderson event and then in Maysville uh, in the last 30 days. While touring these things, we're working into to continued site visits for our meat processing plants. As we talked last time we were here, we've had over 30 projects that uh, we've been, been part of, and uh, I've had $6 million invested into these, uh, literally going across the state from Graves County to Greenup County. And, uh, and Bill and I have visited uh, in the past, uh, the past month uh, facilities in Graves County, Union County, Christian County, and Muhlenberg County, all in uh, various stages of, uh, of some going back You've been in business uh, there in Christian County since 1975 with doing some updates and others. Uh, so be some new facilities coming online. Uh, then I had an opportunity to, uh, to mark the milestone of the 70th county that we've had ag development funds go into for a farmer's market. And that was in McGoffin County. Had your colleague, Representative Blanton, and I uh, were there to cut the ribbon on that project. And that one was a good illustration of leadership. The county agent there, Courtney Jenkins, seemed like they had uh, run into about every type of hiccup you could have with a with a building project like that, but uh, really worked on it, I think, was about a five-year uh, a, a labor of, of passion uh, and, and, again, driving force to get all the community uh, involved. And they've got a beautiful facility uh, there that I was proud to, to be part of. Now, there's more than seven. A uh, few counties have more than one, but uh, that's the 70th county we've got. So look forward to continued uh, expansion of these across our state. And then uh, Chairman Dawson and uh, Senator Westerfield was glad to be back in uh, my hometown of Hopkinsville. And, uh, and congratulations to you both now on being known as the batter capital of the world. So uh, we had the salute to agriculture in, uh, in Hopkinsville this year, and they uh, have now of the moniker of the batter capital of the world. I think tying back with the, uh, the, uh, the milling and processing that we've got going on, uh, value-added agriculture in the community for what they're doing. Director, you... You should tell them what kind of products we have coming out of Hopkinsville that gives us that designation. You ought to rattle off the list. Well, we, we do have a few. Thank you, Senator. And uh, we, we do with Seamer Milling, uh, obviously, uh, is grinding a large portion of our wheat going into Continental uh, Mills, going into uh, the Hopkinsville Milling, that we have uh, quite a few products that you can see on the shelves, everything from your Grimaldi's uh, uh, brownie mix to your, your Krusty's pancakes. I believe every uh, every biscuits you get at mcdonald's on east of the mississippi uh comes from from flour that comes out of uh out of uh the the hopkinsville uh elevate or uh, seamer milling and uh, continental mills uh, i believe a big chunk of your rolled gold pretzels uh come out of uh, flour from there uh and uh, uh let's see how many how many of your pancakes out of denny's uh, i believe all all come out of this uh, this area so senator westfield is correct we've got a lot of uh, uh of value-added products that are coming out of the wheat that is being uh, being produced by kentucky farmers uh from a pretty big radius uh in the state that is bringing in there and we also had uh, had a had a celebrity dan the pancake man that uh, was there making pancakes in the likeness of a, our sponsors and also uh, the commissioner uh, had had one made in his likeness and so i thought that was pretty good i have challenged him to update his uh, profile pic to his pancake so we'll be watching his social media to see if that happens um as I mentioned, heading this week to the State Fair, kicking that off to what we think will be a, be a fantastic event. So following up, uh, that's uh, my activities, but what's been going on with Ag Development and our board? We wrapped up our two-day retreat uh, 
just prior to when I was here last last month, and uh, the follow-up work continues. Uh, last week, a survey went out to all of our stakeholders. This would be our extension agent partners, our administrators of our programs, our uh, county council members, which would be well over 600 uh, just in county council members across the state, and, uh, and as well as uh, members of the Kentucky Ag Council, which would have representation from all of our commodity groups and ag leaders across the state. A list of over 1,400 uh, stakeholders that we've identified uh, that, that in, in some way are participating in our programs. And uh, we'll have our results of this survey back uh, uh, the end of the month. We'll be compiling this, and then we're having a second two-day retreat in October. And uh, both Chairman Emery and Co-Chairman Dawson, I would like to to ask, uh, uh, it's going to work with our schedule, that uh, our two-day session will be uh, beginning uh, the afternoon following our October uh, Oversight Committee meeting. And I'm going to extend an invitation, unless we're having any issues with uh, with capacity, for our board members to, uh, to attend. Uh, we had some board members that said, you know, we've never never been to an oversight meeting and I thought this would be a fantastic opportunity for engagement with this uh, this this oversight committee and our current directors on both the Ag Finance Council and the Ag Development Board so we'll coordinate that as uh, as we get closer to time but uh, would would like to do that with your permission uh, we also had uh, had turnover on the Ag Finance Council. We had a resignation of uh, board member Donald Mitchell, who was a tobacco farmer from Woodford County. Uh, Commissioner Quarles on Friday uh, made the appointment of Dan Flanagan, who will be uh, be replacing uh, Donald on our board. And uh, uh, Dan, uh, long time uh, uh, known in the ag world across Kentucky, is a Taylor County farmer. Uh, president of the Kentucky Poultry Federation, past chair of the Kentucky Council of Ag, and then also a, a very interesting uh, thing on his bio that suits him well for our ag finance is he's a former board member on the National Farm Credit Council. So he is, uh, he has served there at the, the national level there. So we're, we're excited uh, that uh, uh, we were able to get another great uh, board member coming on. And uh, Dan was uh, appointed and, and made it to the first board meeting uh, two hours later. So uh, we're, we're thankful for that and believe he will provide provide uh, great service to Kentucky farmers. And with that, I'll conclude and uh, turn it over to Deputy Director McCloskey for a summary of our project. Okay, we'll give you an update on board action on the July board meeting. You start with page two, so you can see the different programs from CAPE to Deceased Farm Animal, Next Generation, and the Youth Program. Total commitment or approvals was $1,304,843. And then page three and four four reflects amendments to the CAPE program in the page three and four five different counties and if we go to page five we'll get into the update on the project so another meat processor was approved for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars Dowdy's custom meats in uh, Graves County that's about a five hundred thousand dollar improvement just to Remind you that to date, over $6 million has been approved in ag development funds and, and included in that is $2 million in CARES money to help increase our harvest capacity across the state. And this is an ongoing business that primarily did deer processing and taxidermy business. So they've, they've ventured into the custom business of, of uh, processing three cattle and one hog a week. With this uh, upgrade to their facility, they'll be able to go to uh, full capacity, 12 cattle and five hogs. And also moving towards from a custom operation to a USDA graded, which gives farmers the ability to sell product after it's been processed to the public. Versus custom, it can only be used for personal use. All right, moving on to page six, give you an update on Red Leaf Biologics. This is a project that's moving out of the research phase in the UK Incub University of Kentucky Incubator Program. They're looking to uh, contract with farmers to uh, raise red sorghum. As you see in the narrative, that has a lot of nutraceutical uh, properties, a lot of uh, research, a lot of uh, opportunity in a, in a business if they could capture... 1% of the business would be over $150 million in opportunities working with uh, farmers. And this was structured as a direct loan where they can access the money to buy this equipment. So going from a research phase to, to a pilot commercial operation, 
working with about three farmers to grow red sorghum in low in the in the in this central Kentucky area. And rather than do a grant, the board structured this again as a direct loan access to the funds up to uh, 12 months, and then it'd be interest only payment into the second year and third year. At that point, then they could refinance it working with the local lender once we had a chance to reevaluate the, the business rather than just do a grant. No questions. I'll move on to page seven, another processor. So we've, the board has approved projects anywhere from in this case, you know, twenty-five hundred dollars up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Part of some of our bigger project meat processor startups, some of them have been a two and a half million dollar project. So this is a smaller project, but this will allow them to increase, as you can see here in the narrative, increase their capacity ten additional uh, on a beef equivalent. Right now, they're processing about thirty beef a week and forty-five hogs. Moving on to page. Eight with the applicant being Jay Anderson Farm still uh, sticking with the, the the beef theme here. Representative King, this is a, a feasibility study where the board approved half the cost of it, and they're going to pursue the other half in a USDA value added grant to look at evaluating a meat processing facility in southeast Kentucky. They may process up to 100 animals. They would look at cull cows or finished cattle. And see if that's going to be feasible. The entity that will be doing the feasibility study is an entity you're all familiar with. We work quite uh, extensively with KCARD, Kentucky Center for Agriculture and Rural Development. And a lot, they help a lot of uh, uh, businesses or applicants that have undeveloped business plans. We send them to KCARD to help with it. And, of course, they do some feasibility studies for a fee as well. Next, moving on to page nine, we've got the Lincoln County Fiscal Court. So they continue to offer the, the dead animal pickup service they've been de doing since, or we've been providing since 2003. So this is a county commitment only project for $32,441 to upgrade their, uh, their equipment. Page 10, so Representative Dawson, this is going to be one you're familiar with. This is the Christian County Agriculture. Agriculture Extension Foundation approved for $30,000 as part of a over a $60,000 improvement in a commercial kitchen in their uh, newly established Ag Expo. And I, they just recently had a ribbon cutting. I'm sure you, you were there as part of that $2 million Ag Expo, almost an acre under roof that they can provide for agriculture uh, events and other uh, community events. But this is just to help them upgrade the commercial kitchen at the facility. And they did use $400,000 in county money as part of the $2 million uh, project. All right, next, moving on to page 11, we've got the Heinemann Settlement School in Knott County was approved for $5,445 to upgrade their farmer's market. And this is... Uh, this is state money that was allocated to counties. I've given you updates over the last year where the state board committed $484,000 to counties that received less than $30,000 on their allocation. Of course, not uh, Senator Webb, not in Pike or two counties that do not receive based on the formula. I think you were part of that uh, developing that formula so they were allocated thirty thousand dollars and they're using uh, this this amount for the farmers market and the difference has been used to to offer first ever cape program the cost share program county agriculture investment program and that wraps up the projects and then you've got the press release that's page 12 13 and 14. do i have any questions Everyone is satisfied. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Now our next presentation, is it uh, by remote? Yes. Okay, we're ready for the uh, Division of Conservation presentation, uh, Paulette Akers. Ah, hello, how are you? My name is Paulette Akers. I am trying frantically to share my screen. And I am having some technical difficulties. I am the director of 
the Division of Conservation. We see you. You see me, yes. but, but yes. not the presentation. So yeah, let me no. try one more time. It's... We have it in our folder, so. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Well, we will just roll with it that way. Give me just a second so I can make sure and see what you're seeing. It's also but, posted uh, online. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Paulette Akers. I am the director of the Division of Conservation. In your folder, you should have uh, a couple of things. One is a one page front and back summary of state cost share over the past few years. The other thing you should have is a PowerPoint presentation, and that's just a few slides. But uh, the first slide talks about how Tobacco Master Settlement uh, had been just state cost share for the Division of Conservation. But in the last uh, year, it actually included the 907300 indirect aid to conservation districts. So um, there was just under 2.5 million that was given to the cost share portion and then the 907300 for direct aid. The next slide should show you a map of how that direct aid was distributed across the state. That's done through a, a formula uh, by the Soil and Water Conservation Commission based on the needs of those counties. So it's not evenly distributed. It's based on whether or not they receive millage tax and what their balance is and whether or not they've turned in everything they were supposed to in the past couple of years in terms of their reporting to DLG, their uh, annual financial reports, their budgets, um, all of that fun stuff that everybody's required to do. So um, the one after that, hold on, I'm getting to where you all are. Those two I could do off the top of my head, but let's see. So uh, the next one is a summary of the state cost share program. It was originally established in 1994 along with the Agriculture Water Quality Act and does provide funds where it is a 75% cost share. Um, starting in 2000, those funds did come from the Master of Settlement Agreement. We do all sorts of things, but mainly we do a lot of fence and pipeline and uh, watering facilities and rocked gateways and grade stabilization structures and things that prevent soil erosion and protect water quality. The fiscal year 19 uh, funds, we are just closing out that year. Once funds are awarded, they have two years to spend those. So their two years were up August 1st. Uh, we have about 67% of those that have been paid already. There were 722 individuals that received awards for just over four and a half million dollars. Um, we still have about $200,000 that we're waiting on people to send in receipts. Following that, you have a map of where those funds went. Fiscal year 20 was awarded in January of 2020. There were 864 individuals who requested the funds for close to $7 million. We awarded 705 for $4.5 million. We're about 17 months into those projects. We have 15% canceled, 47% paid, and about 1.7 left to pay in those. The slide after that is a map of where those are located. Fiscal year 21 was just approved in February of this year. There were 1,179 individuals that requested about $12.5 million. We were able to approve 592 individuals for just under $6 million. So we're just really getting these, um, beginning to get these on the ground because it takes us a while to get plans for these and the weather to, to cooperate. So we're five months in, we have 2% canceled, 4% paid, and still 5.6 million to distribute from this. 
Then you have a map of where those funds are. Following that, you should have two more maps. Those maps are cumulative for all 27 years of us doing cost share. The darker the county, the more things that we have had applied uh, in those areas. And then you have a slide for the account balance. If you look at our account balance today, it'll be just over, uh, well, close to $13 million, 12.9. There's uh, 907,300 in direct aid that was just deposited in July. So we haven't distributed those funds yet. There's still 220,000 left to go to the FY19, 1.7 to the FY20, 5.6 to the FY21. We still have one project outstanding uh, in the um, RCPP program we had from about six years back. And uh, there is a required 10% contingency set aside of $342,340 which leaves our actual balance of unobligated funds just over $4 million. We are currently accepting applications for this. So uh, they have until November 15th of 2021 to apply. Uh, and we would anticipate distributing all of that 4 million uh, in January at the Soil and Water Conservation Commission meeting following the end of the uh, cost share deadline. Um, I do have a slide following that just to give you guys some idea of what the need is. Uh, we, we actually had a little bit less uh, applications in calendar year 20 because we had done two cost share rounds back to back six months apart instead of a year apart. We still had 864 individuals who asked for 6.7 million. In calendar year 21, these are the ones that we funded in February of this year. So they applied all of 2020. And we had 1,179 individuals apply for just over $12.4 million. Uh, as I mentioned, we have currently um, 4 million unobligated, including the just over two and a half million that was obligated in this fiscal year. And the cutoff is in November. I think the slide following that is my contact information. So I would be happy to answer any questions you all have. Okay, uh, Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Akers, for being here with us today. You know, I have served on this committee for many years, so please pardon my ignorance, but is are all of the allocations uh, directly from tobacco settlement or are there any general fund dollars? I tried to look through the one pager and your PowerPoint. Uh, please help me understand that better. And I apologize for not knowing that already. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's a great question. All of this money is tobacco master settlement agreement funds. Very good. So it's encouraging. Thank uh, you. And initially, I will say uh, from 1994 to 2000, this was pesticide set asides, uh, pesticide registration fees from Department of Ag. So, but since 2000, it's been Tobacco Master Settlement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions from our membership? Okay. Uh, I, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, you stated that most of the applications go for uh, what? Would you repeat that? Uh, fencing and something maybe? Water, so, water. Um, yeah, the, the statute requires that we prioritize livestock and manure related um, best management practices. And so... Um, the five things that we fund most often, not necessarily the most money, but the most frequently are fence, uh, watering pipeline, uh, a watering tank, um, and heavy use areas. So those could be around the watering tank or a winter feeding structure or a rocked gateway where um, a, the tractor is coming in and out. Those are the things we do most often. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions?
I see none. I thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much for the time. Okay, we're ready for the uh, Kentucky Tobacco uh, uh, Preservation and Cessation Program. That is Ellen Carnell. Carmel. It is. I'm going to share my slides with you. Oh, can you all see those? We see you. Okay. Any advice? Oh, there we go. Can you see my slides now? Now we're, do we're doing good. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. As you know, my name is Ellen Cartmel, and I am the new manager of the Kentucky Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Program. Um, I'm going to be speaking with you today about uh, our initiatives to protect the health and economic interests of Kentuckians, as well as the effects of our tobacco settlement agreement funds on our work. So our program uses an evidence-based three-prong approach. The first strategy is to prevent youth from ever becoming addicted to nicotine. The second is to help people who want to quit using tobacco products. And the third is to protect Kentuckians from exposure to secondhand smoke. I'll go into more detail on why, uh, or on what these three strategies entail and why they're important, but I I'd like to start off by talking specifically about our funding and what enables us to do this work. So the Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Program is funded by Master Settlement Agreement Funds, but we're also funded by two grants from the CDC. And those CDC grants pay the majority of our salary, fringe and indirect, as well as travel and um, behavioral risk factor surveillance system questions that allow us to collect the data we need in order to measure the scope of the problem. Uh, I was Glad to hear Representative King's question. Um, we have not received a general fund allocation in the past, as you can see. Um, here's a breakdown of how we plan to spend our MSA allocation specifically for the last fiscal year, as well as the one that began July 1st. Um, in each year, we did receive a $2 million allocation uh, from the legislature. And last year, this was a 43% decrease from our previous funding levels. Uh, we were able to use some carryover funding from previous years in order to continue programming somewhat normally last year in spite of that 43% cut. However, um, in fiscal year 22, we have been forced to cut services, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, as you can see, the largest portion of the funding does go directly to the local health departments for their local programs. Uh, we also have contracts with partner organizations like the Kentucky Cancer Program um, and the University of Kentucky College of Nursing. Furthermore, we have two quit lines that provide no cost services to all Kentuckians who want to quit using tobacco products. And finally, we conduct awareness campaigns to be sure Kentuckians know not only about the dangers of tobacco use, but also those free resources to help them quit. And much of those um, awareness campaign expenses and quit line expenses are also underwritten by our grants from the CDC. So in order to give a little bit more context, um, I've created this graph that shows the amount of MSA budgeted for by the legislature and then received by the state over the past 11 years. Um, it has fluctuated widely during that time, as you can see, but we are at a high point, um, having received $126 million um, in 2021. That bottom line in dark blue that almost looks flat uh, is what has been allocated to prevention, uh, prevention and cessation for tobacco. Um, and the red numbers tell you the percent of projected MSA that has been allocated to prevention and cessation. So as you can see, in 2018, we were receiving over 3% of the MSA fund, and now we're receiving less than 2%. So if we zoom in just to that line um, and look only at it, you can see it's, it's not really as flat as we thought it was. Um, and we can see how drastic the changes have been, particularly that drop from 3.4 million to 2 million last year. Um, it's important to note that while we did technically receive less funding dollar-wise in 2015 than we did this year, we were actually receiving quite a bit more when you look at the percent of total MSA. In 2015, we were receiving 2.4% of total MSA versus 1.9% this year. I'll also take this opportunity to mention that the CDC recommended budget for tobacco prevention and cessation in Kentucky is 56.4 million annually. Um, and so we are currently receiving 3.5% of the recommended amount. 
So why is this so important? Um, there are many reasons. The first being that tobacco use is still the number one leading cause of preventable death and disability in our state. It kills more Kentuckians than alcohol use, drug use, AIDS, car accidents, murders, and suicides combined. Um, and these deaths only reflect the number of people who actually die from their own cigarette smoking. It does not include those affected by other tobacco products like dip or chew, um, and it does not include exposure to secondhand smoke. Unfortunately, we can expect to lose 9,000, almost 9,000 Kentucky adults to their own smoking this year. And that human toll of tobacco use, either directly from someone choosing to smoke or from exposure to secondhand smoke, continues to be the most costly preventable cause of death in our Commonwealth. Tobacco use also has a huge financial toll on our state. And while tobacco taxes do bring Kentucky around $503 million annually, tobacco use is costing the state $589.8 million each year in Medicaid expenses alone, um, so just Medicaid, and the total that Kentucky is spending on um, smoking direct health care costs related to smoking is $1.92 billion. Um, and again, that does not factor in lost productivity or any other economic effects. All of this is affecting the state's economy. Uh, to quote former U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams, the second highest expense for most companies is healthcare, and the biggest driver of healthcare expenses is smoking rates. Um, this is one of many reasons why prevention and cessation programs for tobacco are considered a public health best buy. And as you can see on your screen, the CDC estimates that for every $1 we spend on a comprehensive tobacco prevention and cessation program, Kentucky can expect a $55 return on investment. So in order to combat those deadly health effects and the financial, of to financial toll of tobacco use, we do have those three goals that I mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation. Um, the first of those is to help prevent people from ever getting addicted in the first place. Nicotine ex addiction is expensive, it starts young, and it's tough to quit. 90% of smokers are addicted to nicotine by the age of 18. 99% are addicted by the time they're 26. This is because the adolescent brain is still developing until about age 25. So in our program, we focus on youth because the later in life a person tries their first tobacco product, the less likely they are to get um, become addicted to it. However, e-cigarettes, which I'm sure you all have heard about um, consistently, uh, they're throwing a major wrench into our prevention work. As you can see from this chart, youth vaping has skyrocketed nationwide over the past decade. Uh, we have some data for Kentucky that shows e-cigarette use among high school sophomores jumped 200 percent between 2016 and 2018 alone. Um, in 2018, more than one in four Kentucky high schoolers said they had used an e-cigarette in the past month. And these are products like Juul, uh, Juul pods, which each contain as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. So in addition to the youth vaping crisis being tragic in its own right, trends indicate that the youth vaping epidemic has the strong potential to lead to a new smoking epidemic. Um, discussion of youth vaping frequently mentions uh, a new generation of smokers. Um, former Surgeon General Jerome Adams described e-cigarettes as priming the brain for addiction. Uh, one study found that young people who had ever used e-cigarettes were eight times more likely to use regular cigarettes a year later. And these risks have been particularly pronounced in low-risk youth or people who we would otherwise expect to never try tobacco products. So what are we doing about that? Um, our program's goals in terms of curbing the youth vaping epidemic are to equip schools with the resources that they need, provide peer education to young people, and generally work on awareness to help people understand the dangers of youth e-cigarette use. In a few weeks, um, every public and private school that serves sixth grade and older in Kentucky will receive a toolkit with evidence-based resources to help them curb that epidemic that they're seeing in their schools. We also continue to invest in peer-to-peer -peer education, such as through the University of Kentucky's hashtag I Can End the Trend program, um, which conducted 67 presentations, many of which had to be virtual, um, last year with Kentucky middle or high school students at no cost to the schools. So we know that young people are much more likely to listen to their peers, so this model has proven very effective. 
Um, we have also conducted mass awareness campaigns to discourage youth from using tobacco. One of these campaigns, Down and Dirty, which you see on your screen, um, sent the message that tobacco use just doesn't mesh with common values of family, freedom, and tradition. Um, this media was tested with Kentucky teens to be sure that it was effective, and it has been proven to be memorable, believable, and motivating to youth. Another awareness campaign we're using right now is Behind the Haze, which focuses specifically on um, e-cigarette prevention. Unfortunately, due to the budget cuts um, we've experienced, we were forced to discontinue Down and Dirty for the fiscal year that we are in now. Our next goal is to help anyone who wants to quit do so. And we know that around 70% of smokers say that they want to quit. Um, however, because nicotine is so addictive, it's very difficult to quit without a plan or help. For that reason, we offer two free quit lines, one for teens, which I'll discuss in a minute, and one for all ages, which is Quit Now Kentucky. Um, the most effective action for treating a tobacco addiction is to provide a combination of coaching and quit smoking medications like patches, lozenges, or gum. And we are able to provide both of those uh, at no cost to most Kentuckians through the quit line, and that can double their chances of quitting successfully. One of our particular focus areas for the quit line is pregnant women. Kentucky has the second highest rate of smoking during pregnancy in the nation, with over 18% of Kentucky's pregnant women saying that they smoked at some point during their pregnancy. That can lead to low birth weight babies, cleft palate, and even miscarriages. Carbon monoxide and cigarette smoke can keep a fetus from receiving enough oxygen. That's why expectant mothers um, who smoke are offered more free calls through Quit Now Kentucky, as well as incentives for completing calls. And we're also conducting outreach to OBGYN offices through our partners. Another specialty population for us is, of course, our nation's heroes, um, veterans and members of the armed forces. This is one of the populations with the highest smoking rates, which is something the Surgeon Generals of the Army, Navy, and Air Force have called a threat to military readiness. That's why we have funded partners working on base at both Fort Knox and Fort Campbell, and also providing additional support at the VA hospitals in Lexington and Louisville. Again, our goal is to make sure that the 70% of smokers who say that they want to quit have the evidence-based tools that they need in order to do so at no cost to them. And a third target group for us is people with behavioral health conditions. Research has shown that people with a mental health diagnosis like anxiety, depression, PTSD, et cetera, are more likely to be tobacco users, but they're just as likely as the rest of the population to want to quit. And so our goal is for every community mental health center in the Commonwealth to have at least two certified tobacco treatment specialists on staff. And those are people who um, are professionals who are trained to help them quit smoking. And finally, our newest program, which I mentioned a moment ago, um, is offering quit, um, quit coaching and other free resources directly to teens. And that is called My Life, My Quit. Um, it offers text and phone-based coaching to anyone under, teen, under 18 who wants help quitting smoking products, including e-cigarettes. Um, we are currently in the middle of launching an awareness campaign for this, which will include providing all public and private schools serving sixth grade or older with resources to promote this free program to their students. And quitting has been particularly important over the past year and a half as we have responded to the coronavirus pandemic. People who are current or former smokers are significantly more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 or to die from it. So we're still crunching the numbers for Kentucky, but we do know that in North Dakota, for example, smokers spent an average of one additional day in the hospital with COVID compared to non-smokers. And this one extra day resulted in uh, smokers being charged an average $11,000 more in inpatient charges than non-smokers. Finally, our third main goal of our program is to protect people from exposure to secondhand smoke, which kills around 41,000 uh, people in the United States every year. Currently, we do not have a state law in Kentucky prohibiting smoking in workplaces, and only 36% of Kentuckians are protected from secondhand smoke in their workplace by a comprehensive local ordinance. And you can see the map of where those communities are there um, on your screen. Breathing secondhand smoke can trigger asthma attacks and heart attacks, worsen COPD, 
um, and even result in sudden infant death syndrome. It's also one of several reasons, as the other things I mentioned today, um, why Kentucky has the nation's highest rate of new lung cancer cases. We know that regularly breathing secondhand smoke in your workplace or your home does increase your risk of developing lung cancer by 20 to 30%. So as I wrap up, I'd like to share that in the past, we have provided funding to um, for these three goals to every county in the state through partnership with the uh, 41 local health departments in Kentucky. Um, this was funding for in-person quit smoking classes, um, education in schools, work with coalitions, things like that. Um, however, unfortunately, due to the, bu the budget cuts that we have received, um, we have had to cut our financial support to local health departments in the current fiscal year. Um, we went from providing $2 million in local funding to health departments to providing just 1 million in the current fiscal year. And we also moved to only funding 18 of those health departments. Um, and they were chosen through a competitive application process this year. Um, the map that you can see shows you exactly which uh, health departments are receiving funding. And the counties in white are those that are receiving zero state dollars for tobacco prevention and cessation in the current fiscal year. In conclusion, we are extremely, extremely fortunate um, and unique in that we have um, over 60 years of experience um, and research on tobacco use. We know what works in terms of helping people become tobacco free. Unfortunately, we do not currently have the resources to implement every strategy that we know works or partner with every community or partner um, who, who needs our funding. However, we do remain committed to helping as many youth as possible from ever becoming addicted to nicotine, helping the 70% of tobacco users who want to quit, and protecting all smokers from secondhand smoke. I'm sorry, all Kentuckians from secondhand smoke. So this is the end of my prepared slides, but I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you for your presentation. Certainly a very serious topic. Are there any questions from my committee? You did an outstanding job. There's no questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, your uh, presentation certainly points out uh, uh, things we should be concerned about, and uh, we hope we can be of assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Our next meeting will be Thursday, September 16th at 10.30. Are there any other announcements from any of our members? If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn.